Hello and a very well, warm welcome to everyone who has joined us for our webinar today, Making Geoscience Societies More Inclusive. My name is Fei Lo and I'm currently a PhD researcher at Institute for Environmental Studies, FEM, Phi University, Amsterdam. Today's webinar is hosted by EGU, Atmospheric Science Division and its Early Career Scientist Representative Team. We also have the Division President Thanos and ECS Representative Menzi on board. And we are delighted to have four wonderful speakers with us today and they will be introduced later. Let's give a warm welcome to the first speaker today, Dr. Akuya Aza Awuku. Dr. Akuya Asa Uku is an associate professor at the University of Maryland, College Park. Dr. Asa Awuku's primary research interest is understanding and predicting aerosol sources and interactions with water. Her research explores the water uptake of complex particles as it uh, pertains to aerosol hygroscopicity cloud condensation, nuclear activation, and droplet growth. She received her master's and PhD from Georgia Tech and received her Bachelor of Science from the MIT. In her spare time, Dr. Asa Awuku is a mother, mother, yes, twins, and avid Zomba Afflecinado. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Faye, for that introduction. And I want to thank all the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so as the first speaker, I'm going to give a general overview and also talk about my own experiences in the geosciences. So um, I know there are a lot of scientists in the room, in the virtual room. And so I know scientists, we love data. So I wanted to start off with a, dirt, a, with a story about my personal data. And uh, so what you're looking at here is data that is uh, provided by the University of California system, which is 10 campuses um, in the progressive state of California, where they provide uh, free data on the demographic data of uh, their students and faculty. And so when I started my career in 2008, um, I contributed to this data set. And so six years into the road of my career, I took a little deeper dive into the demographic data. And so what you're seeing here is uh, the demographic data, uh, particularly for engineering and computer science. You notice that geoscience is not listed here. And it turns out that all my degrees are in engineering, even though my research is mainly in atmospheric science. And so I looked into the engineering data. It's for faculty of ladder rank or tenure track rank. And so what you see is uh, the majority of faculty in the UC system, which is 10 campuses and some other affiliates, is male. And only 15.6% of the tenure track faculty are female. When it comes to demographics, um, we have listed uh, other unknown, white, Asian Pacific, Hispanic Latino, American Indian, and Black African American. And you can see that the people of color make a quite a small percentage of the faculty. So I started my career in 2008. And if you zoom in, really look closely, you can see the bump in the uh, percentage of black faculty from when I joined from 2007 to 2008. And so I found it really miraculous that I could see myself in the data. What you don't see here is the intersectionality of gender and race. And so what I soon came to find is that actually I was the only black female on in, in engineering in all 10 campuses um, who was a faculty member. And of course, uh, that's engineering. And so when it comes to geoscience, we know that geoscience is the least diverse discipline in science, technology, engineering, and math. What we know is that when it comes to uh, women faculty, or I should say women in the geoscience STEM force, uh, we only comprise 30% of the STEM workforce um, and 24% of the geoscience workforce. So when it comes specifically to women faculty in the geosciences, what we, we know about women is that 
they, we are predominantly represented um, in non-tenure track instructor and lecturer positions. And those are typically the most insecure and lowest salary levels. Um, a survey of uh, new principal investigators, investigators in the UK actually found uh, gender disparities in starting salaries, startup funding and teaching and administrative loads. And so that is published work. Analysis of the allotment of telescope use um, at a European observatory also found that the ratings of user proposals differed by gender. And so we have a lot of work to do as a geoscience field. So when it comes to degrees in geoscience, some more information. What we know is that 90% of doctoral degrees in geoscience are awarded to white people. Uh, and so when it comes to faculty, specifically faculty of color, we only hold about 3.8% of the tenured or tenure track positions in the top 100 geoscience departments. What we know about persons from sexual and gender minorities and Black and Hispanic people, we actually lead the field at higher student attrition rates. And so we know, we know there's an issue in geosciences that needs to be addressed. And there's tons, um, I would say there's hundreds of literature in the field of geoscience education and diversity that we can access to, for this information that has been peer reviewed um, and scientifically ratified. So typically um, after learning about such information, um, I'm often asked, what should we do next? Well, my response is always, well, who sits at your table? And so I'm discussing a proverbial table, a lunchroom table, something that I think many of you have experienced going into a cafeteria and figure out where to sit. Well, I will say many of us eat at a scientific table where we are very comfortable. We go every day and we know who sits at our table. We're friends with them. Um, but there's also the table, there's also people who'd like to sit at our table. So I like to do periodically an assessment of who sits at my table. And so um, if I look at 52 researchers who have come through my research group, I know that roughly 50% uh, at the graduate level or higher have been uh, female, less than the undergraduate. And overall, I'm about that 50% mark in terms of male to female ratio. When it comes to demographics, I know that I have a diverse group of international, which is non-US uh, domestic students and domestic students um, that are Asian, Hispanic, uh, Black, and also Native American, and also white who have come in through, in through my group. And I'm proud of the diversity that my group represents in that. When it comes to uh, students who just identify as women, I see that we're, um, demographically dispersed through the graduate, undergraduate levels. Uh, and it turns out where they go is also diverse as well, that we are graduating students who then enter government industry and academia with uh, geoscience um, positions. So once doing that assessment, the question is where do we go from there? Uh, my answer is to invest. And so here I'll do a little lesson in uh, entomology. And so invest is actually a 14th century word. Um, and it's a Latin word to clothe um, somebody. It also has a roots in it, old Italian, investere. And the common definition is to commit money in order to earn a financial return. Uh, I believe we do need to invest. We do need to financially support our students, but we also need to involve and engage, especially emotionally, uh, for the next generation of geoscientists, diverse geoscientists, so that in turn we can furnish them with the authority to lead and uh, engage in geoscience. Um, and so some of my work, in addition to the research that I do, is to engage in this investment of students. And so I want to talk briefly about a recent grant where we're looking at the geoscience ecosystem model. Uh, we don't talk about a leaky pipeline anymore. Who wants to talk about pipelines and oil spills in geoscience? So we talk about an ecosystem model of developing um, the next generation. And in this ecosystem learning model, 
we think about uh, that we're proposing, we're looking at training um, introductory geoscience courses for not necessarily traditional geoscience students and providing these technical foundations so they can actually have uh, the knowledge and the expertise in addition to a vertical mentoring structure uh, to grow uh, their self-efficacy and also to support them through the process. Um, we're also trying to engage these students with workforce opportunities and exposure to laboratory visits. Um, so real world exposure and things like that. And of course, this is an ecosystem. So it all feeds back into the technical foundations that will grow. And so this is a recent award that we uh, received. Um, it's led by myself and uh, two other black female colleagues at the University of Maryland um, to really start to build this culture and geo ecosystem um, in the geosciences. So um, in addition to the research I do in geoscience, I'm also invested in the growth of geosciences. Um, I firmly believe in this quote that you want to be the change you see in the world. And in order for others to do this as well, I always say, who, who will you invite to the table? And so in the subsequent talks, um, I think we will hear about who is at these different tables, um, whether they're in field work, uh, in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality and how to support um, the different types of researchers coming through to the next level. Um, thank you, Dr. Arthur Awuku. That was a great introduction and lays the outline for our webinar today. And our next speaker, um, Dr. Mike Puraya Jones is an electronic engineer and glaciologist working for Cardiff University, primarily on wireless instruments for making measurements within and below glaciers. He has had a var varied career in both industry and academia as an engineer and project manager. He is a member of PRIDE in Polar Research, which is a network work for LGBTQ plus people working in polo science. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, and uh, I'm here to give an LGBTQ plus perspective. And what I've done is I've made my slide so you can put the speaker video in the top right hand corner. And um, so if you do that now, then uh, it'll be out of the way and you'll be able to see the rest of the uh, material on my slide. I thought I'd start uh, by um, answering the question I quite often get when I uh, talk about uh, at LGBTQ plus events uh, in science uh, and that is uh, why can't we just talk about the science? Why, why is it important to know about your personal life? Uh, why does it matter? And it's this concept of what we call representation uh, which is really really important. Um, if you are looking at an organisation or looking at a whole field of study from the outside, perhaps if you're a young person uh, choosing a career or you're looking at an institution that you might like to join uh, then you look at that organization and you think are there people like me in that organization um, if you don't see or hear people who look and sound like you or people who identify like you do then it's very easy to assume that organization is not for you and this is really exacerbated if you experience some kind of discrimination because if you don't see people like you in that organization you will naturally jump to the conclusion that the people who are already in that organization are in some way discriminatory um, so it's really important that uh, people are represented we want to have uh, a greater diversity of voices uh, and perspectives within science which is important and leads to better scientific outcomes then it's important that people feel that they are represented so I take part in LGBTQ plus science events and also if I give a science talk I actually put a mention of a networking organization on my title slide, uh, Pride of Polar Research in my case, uh, which just sort of flags it up and says look I am part of this, uh, I am part of this particular minority um, and that's important to me. So I thought I'd start by talking about this book uh, which is by Jeanette Winterson who's Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Manchester, she's a British literary writer and she came out as a lesbian in her teens uh, and this quote, this is her autobiography, uh, the, the title is a quote from her adoptive mother who said to her, why be happy when you could be normal? It's a really powerful sentiment, uh, this idea that uh, society compels you to be normal where that's defined in a particular way. 
Um, and so I wanted to kind of point, point out how much that can really hurt and to look at these kinds of questions and some of these uh, sort of statements of advice um, that um, basically boil down to why aren't you normal? And where that's defined as why aren't you like me? Um, and uh, the advice can be well meant, you know, you should be more professional, but uh, actually often it can boil down to you should be more normal, you should be more like me. So try and avoid making those kinds of statements. Um, it's, it really can hurt. Uh, I want to talk about gender briefly. Um, it's a whole field of study in its own right, so um, there is lots more complexity. But the word gender is used to refer to the identity and social aspects of sex. So gender identity is about how you perceive yourself you know, as a man, as a woman, as non-binary. Uh, uh, um, gender presentation is about how you present yourself to others. So you seeing me now, you make the reasonable assumption that I am a man because of the way I present myself, the way I look, the way I sound, the way I dress, the way I behave. That's my presentation. Um, but gender isn't just man or woman, and many cultures have more than two genders. Um, Non-binary people, uh, we're seeing increasing visibility of now, these are people whose gender does not fit into the binary of man or woman. You may hear the related term gender queer. Um, Gender isn't necessarily static. Some people's gender changes with time uh, and they may like to use the word gender fluid. That's a term that, that you hear used sometimes. Um, this long-winded acronym LGBTQ plus is used to encompass a whole range of different identities. Um, the reason I put this up here is these are the words the community likes to use about themselves. Um, so these are the words you should use when you're writing. Um, and uh, Try and avoid falling into the trap that scientists fall into of using scientific language and thinking that that is somehow neutral. Uh, actually, it's quite offensive to be talked about like you're a lab experiment. So, um, yeah, please stick to the words that uh, the communities use themselves. Uh, a style guide is really helpful. I recommend the BBC one, which is free to use online. Uh, I will just mention briefly, when I've, I've, I've talked about culturally specific genders at the bottom here, if you do any work with American universities in the diversity space, you may come across two-spirit, which is a culturally specific gender for people who are indigenous North Americans, for Native Americans and um, First Nations people. Um, so that's specific to them and, and, describes, and describes them. So it's not something that somebody from outside of those communities can personally identify with. Uh, other, cult other countries and cultures have their own uh, culturally specific genders. Uh, names are really important, um, and um, this is basic politeness, really. Uh, the name someone uses is very personal, don't mess with it. Um, if you don't get someone's name, you don't understand it, you don't recognise it, just ask them to say it again, make sure you get the pronunciation right. Uh, people will you know, extend you some patience uh, while you do that. Uh, for LGBTQ plus people, it's relatively common for preferred name not to be the same as your legal name. Uh, and so it's, it, if, you, if you put a statement on a form like, like we want somebody's full name or somebody's full legal name, you probably don't really need that unless you're booking them an air ticket. So just, preferred name is really, helpful. It's really helpful. That indicates that's the name I want to be called by. Um, pronouns. It's really it's become common for people to put pronouns on email signatures, Twitter bios, and things like that, and that helps to normalise things for non-binary, genderqueer, and trans people who may be using other pronouns. They is the most commonly used pronoun by non-binary people. Um, but bear in mind um, that at the moment there's a very nasty little culture war going on, particularly in the UK, uh, around the rights of trans people. Uh, if you put your preferred pronouns on things, then you are labelling yourself as being on the side of trans people, which is a good thing, but you may get some backlash from people on the other side. So just be careful. Um, something that uh, EGU could do and, or think about doing uh, is um, helping trans people with uh, this issue around old publications. So to explain, uh, trans people find being dead named, which is to be called call them by the name that they were given at birth or the name that they had before they transitioned, um, they find that very offensive and hurtful. But if you have transitioned in adulthood and you have published under your dead name and then transitioned and continued in academia to publish under your new name, then you um, then you have this issue that you have your publications under two different names. And 
trans researchers very much would like the option of changing their name on their old publications. It's quite complicated. There are a lot of legal and um, technical issues around it. But ACM, which represents computer scientists, has brought out a new policy to allow that in their journals. And I, I think EGU should look at that and try and adopt some of the same uh, approach. It is a complex issue, but I think it's worth the effort. Uh, scientific societies, um, I wanted to talk about what we can do within an organisation like EGU. Um, just to make the obvious point that we're all volunteers, people need to feel welcomed and appreciated or they just leave. Um, so the most important thing is that people who are in a leadership position, either you know, a, a, a senior position or even just within a local group or a small uh, committee, the leader creates the culture around them. If you are warm and friendly and helpful and inclusive, then other people around you will be warm and friendly and helpful and inclusive. If you are critical or cynical or difficult or competitive or unpleasant, then other people around you will feel that that's the way that you behave in order to get on and will also behave in that way. So try and foster an inclusive atmosphere. Um, try and ensure that everyone gets heard and meeting chairing is really important. Uh, I think EGU should offer training on how to do it. It's a useful skill. It makes meetings loads more efficient if you have a good chair and it also ensures that everyone it feels that, that they are listened to and that their point is, is put across fairly. If you recruit volunteers for a committee or for an event or something like that, make an extra effort to ensure you reach out beyond your usual network. And you can use organisations which particularly represent minorities uh, to help you with that. Uh, I want to say very briefly on the subject of meetings, the world of conferences is a whole other world to talk about, I don't really have time, uh, but um, meeting venues, um, even within Europe but certainly around the world, the legal and social environment for LGBTQ plus people varies considerably. There are places I would not be comfortable going because the political and legal environment makes it difficult for me, even as a relatively straight presenting gay man. Uh, so it's much more difficult for people who are not particularly gender conforming or whatever. Um, so think about your meeting venue. There are a couple of guides here which show you what the legal environment is like in different countries. Um, Offering remote participation is a kind of partial mitigation, but it, uh, it would be better to avoid going to places that are particularly unpleasant for LGBTQ plus people. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, that was a very nice talk. And our next speaker is Dr. Malina Kretschmer. She had her PhD in climate physics at the Potsdam Institute uh, for climate impact research. Um, and now she is a postdoc at the Meteorology Department in Reading. And her research interests are large scale climate dynamics, extreme weather events, and possibilities of applying machine learning to climate science. Now, uh, let's welcome Malina. Hi, um, I hope you can hear me. Good. Okay. Hi, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so I was asked to talk about parenthood in academia and share my perspective as an early career female scientist. And I will also start with some, well, not particular data, but um, actually like a nature, a nature news article, which was published recently, um, which asked, are women publishing less during the pandemic? Um, and um, well, basically the, the, the data from different pre-printing service shows that, well, maybe not so surprising, that um, since, since March, basically publications and submissions from women went down um, compared to different, um, to other years. And this is both for first author, um, female first authors, but also for co-authorships. And the likely explanation is, of course, that women um, have more care, care responsibilities than their male colleagues. Um, well, obviously, we don't know all the implications yet for of Corona, but um, I think I probably speak for, for all parents with young children um, that the last month have been, of course, very hard uh, work-wise. Um, and of course, all, yeah, like everybody, um, we are, of course, also very much concerned that uh, kindergartens will be closed again or there's like another lockdown. And this is um, where the whole pandemic is, of course, an extreme situation, but I do think that it reflects um, a systematic problem um, that it's still quite hard for women um, or for parents and, and for women in particular with children in, uh, with, uh, in academia. And um, um, because 
of course, this is now on the um, well, on the pandemic uh, level. Um, I do think that the same mechanisms which will, which are preventing women from working at the moment um, will also be at play um, in the small scale. For example, when a family member is sick. Um, okay, this was just a teaser. Um, so what, what makes it hard uh, in academia as a parent? And um, I would first like to stress that um, the things I'm presenting is, um, well, first of all, a more personal perspective. Uh, and also, um, I'm also lucky enough to have a, a healthy child um, and also a partner who raises it with me. So um, for single parents, also pa with uh, parents of children with special needs, things are, of course, much more difficult. Um, to start with, with pregnancy, I, um, I experienced this um, as a very uncertain uh, time with respect to my career. So the reactions um, from my work environment and also privately were very positive, but still I didn't really know what uh, to expect. And then um, you often get uh, questions like, how will you manage or how will you do it? And obviously you don't have any answer. So um, I yeah, found this a bit um, like an uncertain time. Um, plus, it was also the first time I basically experienced um, in my work environment, at least, that people questioned um, my personal judgment and um, regarding what, what I should do or what I cannot do during pregnancy. Um, okay, then maternity leave. Um, I think this is, of course, it also depends really on from country to country how long people are on maternity leave and uh, basically what is possible for them um, to do. Um, I think one maybe fear like work-wise is that you are will you, you that you will miss out uh, on things. Um, I actually didn't find this to be the case. I was on maternity leave for eight months. Um, I didn't, I don't think that I missed that much uh, except for publication. So I'm definitely can still not catch up with the publication from that time. But personally, I didn't feel that I um, missed out much. But I also have to say that this was, in my case, this was between jobs, like after finishing my PhD. So um, this can, of course, also be very different and much harder in other work situations. And then, um, well, phase three, maybe, is the returning to work. And I think this is when the, the, the hard part really starts, because, um, well, you have little sleep in the beginning. Um, but you basically have two full-time jobs and this, these two jobs, um, well, having a child and uh, working in academia um, also means that you have um, two times the expectations and this is expectation on yourself, but also from your family or from your, from your from colleagues um, and also maybe society, depending, um, again, this can be culturally very different, but um, there are always expectations on mothers, on scientists, on women in general. So, um, I think at this point, you can be sure that you will definitely fail some of them. Um, and then finally, and I think this is probably the most important part, which makes it so hard, is, um, is time. That just uh, for having another job uh, as a parent, you just have way less time and you are just less flexible. And um, this is an, an issue again in the context of, of um, career in academia because basically the CV or your CV is always judged on based on what you accomplished, um, so the absolute amount, and it does not really take really um, as they take into account how much time uh, you had spent on achieving this. So um, yeah, this is of course where you can either unfair or a problem that it's basically your efficiency is, it, it does not depend how efficient you were in achieving those things. Um, what matters in the end often for grants or for maybe for future jobs is like uh, how much you achieved. Uh, another thing is of course, well, this also changed recently, um, but um, many work relations are built on conferences and for, for parents with young children, this is of course much more difficult um, to do. So um, Faye also asked me to give some advice. I don't know for early uh, for parents, uh, early career scientists. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm the expert uh, yet uh, on this, um, given that my, my child is also still small, but I think a few things which helped me um, or which I think would have helped me. Um, one point is that you just have to accept that you just won't sustain the same workload and that you just, you will miss out opportunities. Um, 
So, and well, what follows immediately from that is that you have to prioritize. So you just have to um, learn to say no to certain projects. Um, I actually don't think this is just a bad thing. I think this is something um, we have to learn anyways in academia. So um, also, let's say after struggling with this for a while, I do think that is also can help you to be, to actually be more efficient and focus on what's really matters and on the projects which are really important to you. Another point is that it, I think, and, and this is basically also what Mike just said, it, that uh, role models are really um, important. And um, personally, I didn't have, I think, any kind of uh, female um, professors um, with children around um, from which I could um, profit from the experience. Um, but I think this is really important, like um, talking to others and, um, yeah, asking them how they how they did it, how um, they managed, uh, which type of advice they have. And then maybe um, also, it's, I think also see to see the positive side, thing, uh, side of things, um, well, apart from, from the child, um, that of course academia does give you some uh, re relatively flexible working hours. And also um, when you're at home and also on the weekends, you're really forced uh, to detach from work. So when you're home, you're home, you have no time to work. Um, I think this is also actually something which is good because I think other, like many people uh, also struggle with this um, separating work and um, yeah, work-life balance. Um, well, maybe on the more um, general side, so what could help parents? And um, I also want to mention, um, well, this list might not apply to everybody and also um, actually reached out to different colleagues and friends with children and also ask them for their opinions. And so this is maybe a little list, um, yeah, which we think could make a difference. So first of all, I think career advice um, is helpful, especially, for example, during pregnancy. And um, I mean this in a very broad sense, so it could also be some kind of mentoring. But again, since pregnant, you don't know anything, like you don't know what it means to, um, to have a child. So I think um, people will help you to, to focus on the important things. Um, yeah, um, this can be useful. Um, I think it really needs like adjusting criteria for grants, jobs and awards. So um, I know that some um, grant schemes already have them. So for example, they permit um, people with children more time to apply for certain early career um, fellowships. Um, but I think it could, should also, or could also be kind of a re review criteria to consider um, um, yeah, the care responsibilities of, of uh, parents. Then, of course, awareness and empathy, this always helps. So, but um, I think the same could also uh, apply for, for line managers, for example, um, that they get dedicated training to, um, to, uh, to mothers who just return from parental leave given that it's really like a, a stressful time. Um, I think also generally, this does not apply in my case, but I mean less academic, academic duties, like teaching responsibilities or other things could also help. Um, actually, no talks in the afternoon is also helpful. So um, it, for me, it was actually not that easy to, to join because the afternoons I'm, uh, I'm usually um, not working. Um, and then finally, maybe this is also relevant for, for EGU, um, some carers fund, um, which could help parents to attend conferences um, so that they can pay a babysitter or a relative to travel with them, because this is usually not covered. And um, this also, of course, excludes uh, people with less income uh, or less fi financial possibilities to attend conferences. So thank you and happy to discuss more points. Thanks very much, Melina. Um, our next speaker is Professor Dr. Hendrata Ali. And in June, she led a petition called for a robust anti-racism plan for the geosciences. And that got more than 25,000 signatures. And recently, she also successfully co-organized the Black in Geoscience Week. And she's currently leading two international field-based geoscience projects and she also rece received many awards, including uh, SCG Outstanding Educator Award. Um, now let's welcome Dr. Ali. All right, thank you. Um, 
Thanks me for the introduction. Can everybody see my screen okay? All right, so I, I'm happy to be here. I wish I were not here to talk about this. Um, it's not what I would be, would say I would be excited, looking forward to talking about. But um, let's talk about doing field work while black and woman. So, Josephs um, and field work have a very intimate relationship. Um, we know that Josephs, just scientists consider field work for the most part as a rite of passage for most undergraduate programs. Um, it creates, if you are able to do field work, you definitely have more opportunities for funding. It is viewed primarily as a manly endeavor, you know, just about everywhere in the world. So if you are not a man to begin with, if you are not a white man, um, field work can be really unsafe and very inaccessible. So while I was trying to prepare for this presentation, I kind of um, went and slotted on the EGU webpage and I found these really beautiful pictures. And I just want everybody to take a moment and look at these pictures and see what you think about them. And I would ask a few questions to see if you can discuss it a little bit more. So when you looked at these questions, if I were to ask you, and I have, I don't know the answers, but if you were to guess or speculate on who captured these pictures, who was a person who was out in the field, who comes to your mind? Is it a woman? Is it a man? Is it a woman of color? Is it a man of color? Is it a white man? Is it a white woman? Who really comes to your mind? Feel free to share your opinion in the chat box if you want to, but I just want you to think about it on a personal basis. These are really some beautiful pictures. And I believe that because we primarily express our Josiah's love or interest with beautiful field pictures, field work continues to be very, very essential and central to what we do even though we have to acknowledge that science and good geoscience now happens in other spaces that are not filled. So there are people who sit behind the computers and do amazing things. There are people who do work in the lab. There are people who do work in the classroom. But still, we express our love for geoscience with field work. So I want to put this quote here that I found captured a lot of the essence of what it is like doing field work as a black woman. I am often fearful about doing certain things alone and I take as many precautions as I can. However, as a black woman, I have yet another set of circumstances to consider. I have to reconcile that as much as I love being in nature and seeing the world, there are those who wholeheartedly believe someone like me has no right to be there simply because I'm black. I think this captures about anything I could really want to say in terms of my experience as a black woman doing field work. So we do do field work despite all these challenges as black women. And from my personal experience, again, I have to disclaim here that I have not conducted um, extensive studies of all black women who do field work. But from my own experiences, and observations. As a black woman, you also do field work as an ethnic or racial minority. You do field work in a patriarchal community. So even if you're in an all black community, you're still a black woman and you have to deal with some realities. As a black woman, you can also be on the LGBTQ um, spectrum or you can be disabled. You can have other underrepresented identities. You can be Black and Latinx. You can be Black and um, Indigenous. No matter your other identities, doing field work as a Black woman remains something that is very dangerous. I've had the opportunity to share my, my thoughts about um, field work experiences in a podcast with um, SEG Seismic Sound Off, but I will just share some experiences that I have had doing field work here in the US um, as a black woman and doing field work in Cameroon as a black woman. And 
in both of these environments, I have had to face some challenges, not because I was not a good scientist, a competent scientist, or a capable scientist, but because I was a black woman. In, 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 um, as an ethnic racial minority, when I go out to the field, I think I would say that my luck has been in being at a mostly white institution where let's say 80, 90% of my students are white male. And if I happen, if I go out to the field with them, often they are given more um, courtesy and more respect, if you will, or more consideration than I am. So they often find themselves having to step in and basically vouch for me because I'm in a community where people don't just expect me to either lead or manage or I just come across as suspicious. When I go to Cameroon as a black woman in a community that is 99% black people, then I have to face the challenge of doing field work as a woman. Again, if I'm accompanied by any men, black or white, the, the, the courtesy is given to them and not to me. And sometimes this means that I have to deal with harassment, microaggression, sexual harassment, intimidation, bullying, you name it, it happens. So the question then is, what can we do um, as individuals, as societies, as institutions, organizations to make fieldwork more inclusive. I want to say it's going to require significant work, but we have to start by talking more, communicating more, and educating more. We have to name things so that people understand that they do exist and that they happen. Then we train. Because we are in education, we have to provide education and training. It is very important to assess the racial, gender, and identity-based risk that your team and your community can be exposed to when you are going out to the field. With that information, you can provide training. You have to know the host community. Different communities have norms, they have rules, they have policies, they have practices. Some are written, some are not written. But as a team leader, as a society, if we are going to go somewhere and organize a field trip or a field camp or a conference, you have leverage. You can engage that community with your first power. If we don't come to an agreement about how we treat our members, maybe we would not consider this or that opportunity. You but those of us who have the privilege, we need to be able to use it to make it inclusive and safe for everybody. We also need to be able to think and plan to encourage and empower our team members to be allies. Like I said, my students have often been allies to me. Either intentionally or unintentionally, they have been because they had that privilege of kin tone that I don't have. So if they are not aware of it, then maybe you need to do some training. You also have to acknowledge, and I think this is the most, the hardest part, that that best mate, that best friend, that fun person that you love to be out in the field with might be somebody's field work nightmare. Because guess what? We all know these people who are harassing, who are bullying, who are intimidating, and sometimes they are, yes, our best mates. Be present as a leader. Make sure that your team knows that you are available to watch their back. That is our responsibilities if we are leading a team. And maybe we should also think about planning with the same diligence that we plan for other field aspects. We really take a lot of care when we are going out into the unknown to plan for personal protective equipment, health resources, 
we should maybe put a little bit more effort in planning for the racial, gender, and identity risk in the same manner. All of this would not work if we do not train. I think there are other things that I could add to this, but in the interest of time, I want to say that for references and resources, please um, check some of these websites. So the Advanced Geo Partnership has a lot of resources and references, readings, tips, guidance to um, field work. I'm part of the Advanced Geo training team. So we definitely do do training on this. The International Association for IAGD, I think that's um, kind of skipping my mind a little bit, but they also do um, a lot of training, especially for disabilities in, um, in the geosciences. So they have a lot of resources for people who need to plan for field safety and field accessibility for disabled folks. That is very important. Um, I know that I think based in the UK, there's Tiger and STEM that also have a lot of resources. These are the websites that I have referenced and looked at and that I go to when I need to get information about how to organize field work. Because one of the most important thing about doing field work that we always have to remember is that we have different needs as field participants, as men, as women, as LGBTQ people, as disabled people. We have different needs and we cannot always, without educating ourselves, predict the needs of the other person. So it is very, very important that we should think about these, these things. Um, with that, I think um, I would hand over to our hosts and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you very much to all our speakers today. The recording of this webinar will be added to EGU's YouTube channel in approximately one week's time. Thank you for participating and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. That was very thank good. <laughs> thank you to all the speakers.